President Trump on the road. We have to close down our government. We're building that wall. The commander in chief hits on several hot button issues from race relations to the wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. We're at the White House. Christian persecution. We speak to a former congressman about what needs to happen in Iraq to protect Christians. Papal intervention. We'll tell you why Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is reaching out to the Holy Father. Plus, increasing hope. The Pope's message to the faithful and what it has to do with a sour chili pepper. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, August 23rd, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. The president continues his visit to the West with a stop in Nevada. <laughs> president Trump is preaching unity today at the American Legion's convention in Reno, where he signed into law a bill for veterans. The ple president pledges to, quote, give our men and women in uniform the tools they need and the trust they have earned to fight and win. The stop in Nevada comes after a fiery speech by the president at a political rally in Phoenix last night. He started with calls for unity, but erupted in anger at the press and the GOP. Correspondent Mark Irons has more from the White House. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. Unity is on the president's agenda today, but last night an angry Donald Trump blamed the media for misrepresenting his response to violence in Charlottesville, Virginia. A night of unfiltered Donald Trump began with prayer. The niece of Martin Luther King Jr. Oh Lord, touch every house, every heart. And the son of Reverend Billy Graham. We're divided politically. We're divided racially. Calling for unity before the president laid the blame. If you want to discover the source of the division in our country, look no further than the fake news and the crooked media. President Trump addressing last week's deadly white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. Critics say the president's response was weak. Trump is not letting it go. They don't want to report that I spoke out forcefully against hatred, bigotry, and violence, and strongly condemned the neo-Nazis, the white supremacists, and the KKK. The president also accused Democrats of choking his legislative agenda before turning on his own party. I will not mention any names. But it was clear he was taking aim at both of Arizona's Republican senators. First, John McCain, who voted against the bill to replace parts of Obamacare. Think, we were just one vote away from victory. And Senator Jeff Flake. Nobody wants me to talk about your other senator who's weak on borders weak on crime, so I won't talk about him. The familiar campaign chant rang out in Phoenix, the president saying that a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border is absolutely necessary, issuing a threat to lawmakers. The obstructionist Democrats would like us not to do it, but believe me, if we have to close down our government, we're building that wall. A big advocate for strict border enforcement is former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who was convicted in federal court for disobeying court orders to stop his immigration patrol. Now, the president has the power to pardon Joe Arpaio's conviction, and he suggested last night in Phoenix that he would do so. Mark, talks are underway to renegotiate the North America Free Trade Agreement, a deal between the U.S. and Canada and Mexico that creates a trade block in North America. But I understand President Trump says it may not be around for long. That's right. The president says the U.S. will end up probably terminating NAFTA uh, at some point. He said he hasn't made up his mind yet. But meanwhile, Canadian and Mexican negotiators say they want to update NAFTA, not do away with it. Correspondent Mark Irons at the White House. Thank you, Mark. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops is establishing a committee against racism. Chairman Bishop George Murray calls it a cancerous reality, but says Christians have the antidote. Here we have a a social problem, racism, which needs to be enlightened by the gospel. 
through the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to find a different way of relating to each other. So the task force is going to create some concrete things that we feel should be done across the country. Bishop Murray says all people are called to recognize that every human being is created in the image and likeness of God. The new committee will be organizing a national summit of religious leaders to discuss the issue. A private feud between the president and majority leader Mitch McConnell? That could be, according to a new report by the New York Times. The two haven't spoken, it says, in nearly two weeks. And sources tell the Times the last call between them went so badly it devolved into yelling. A White House official dismissed the extent of the rift but didn't deny that the two haven't spoken in weeks. The U.S. Navy dismisses Vice Admiral Joseph O'Coin as the commander of the U.S. 7th Fleet in the wake of a series of ship accidents in the Pacific. The latest one happened Monday when the USS John S. McCain collided with a merchant vessel near Singapore. Ten sailors are missing. The Navy says some of their remains have been recovered. An airstrike by a Saudi-led coalition strikes a hotel near Yemen's capital, killing at least 41 people. This conflict has killed more than 10,000 civilians and has displaced 3 million people. It's pushing the impoverished nation to the brink of famine. Now, those fighter jets targeted a two-story hotel in the town of Arhab, about 20 miles from the capital. The escalation comes amid a standoff in Yemen's capital, Sana'a between Shiite fighters and loyalists of ousted President Ali Abdullah Saleh. At least seven people are dead after a Taliban suicide bomber targeted a military convoy in Afghanistan's southern province. The attack came just days after President Trump announced his new strategy in America's longest war. U.S.-backed forces in Syria seize control of key areas in ISIS's capital, Raqqa. It follows several months of intense combat operations in the war-torn country. And now, Defense Secretary James Mattis says the terror group's strongholds in Iraq are also shrinking in size and number. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby has the latest from the Pentagon. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. Secretary Mattis says he's confident ISIS will be defeated, saying the terrorists are on the run and are unable to stand up to U.S.-backed forces in combat. He says most recently the terrorist group is being squeezed in a town in northern Iraq. The Iraqi military says they've captured two neighborhoods from ISIS in the village of Tal Afar. The push comes a month after Iraq ousted the militants from Mosul, the country's second largest city. Meanwhile, members of the U.S.-backed Syrian Democratic Forces push into Raqqa. Coalition leaders say they are winning the fight. The SDF are making incremental gains on multiple fronts, and ISIS fighters are suffering considerable losses. I asked the U.K.'s Major General Rupert Jones, who was speaking via satellite from Baghdad, if squeezing ISIS from both Syria and Iraq at the same time has always been the strategy. I think that has always been the case. I mean, I think for a considerable period of time, we have recognized that to some degree, the campaign to defeat Daesh ends in what we characterize as the Middle Euphrates River Valley. The update from Iraq coincides with Defense Secretary Jim Mattis' visit to Turkey today. He's talking about strategy with his military counterparts. Mattis held talks with Turkey's President Erdogan. The two NATO members do not agree on one key issue, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Turkey does not support the U.S.-backed group, which is led primarily by Kurdish forces. Turkey has a large Kurdish population and is battling Kurdish rebels. Back in Iraq, the Kurds will be voting this September on whether to secede from the country. Secretary Mattis also asked Iraqi Kurds this week to consider postponing the independence referendum. The Kurdish region is already at, or operates independently, but Mattis says the vote could politically be a distraction. And he says the goal right now is to stay focused on defeating ISIS. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby at the Pentagon. Former Congressman... Frank Wolf of Virginia believes, quote, we will see the end of Christianity if nothing is done to protect Christians and Yazidis in northern Iraq. He has drafted a report with his policy recommendations on how to protect him. Joining us now is the former congressman, Frank Wolf of Virginia. Thank you so much for being sure, here. Thank you. You've just returned from Iraq. I know uh, in April I witnessed firsthand the plight of Christians there when I um, traveled through those just terrible war-torn cities. Tell us about your trip, what you saw. 
Well, I saw what you saw. We went into Bartella. We were in Mosul and Karakush, and we met with all the leaders of the Christian community, uh, the Yazidi community. And quite frankly, there's hope in a the sense they want to go back. The number one issue is protection. They need protection. They need a a American military base to train their people, to train their, their police. They need infrastructure, they need water, but they need us to be involved. Secondly, if we don't do anything, we'll see the end of Christianity, we'll see continued persecution of Yazidis. As this moment, there are 3,000 Yazidi women and girls who are still being held by, by ISIS. And lastly, you will see an Iranian crescent where the Iranians will have a land a corridor coming from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon with a port on, on the Mediterranean. So this is a time for the administration to have fresh eyes on a target, a new but, approach, and a new team to take the leadership. Fresh eyes are what you recommended in 2005. You created a study group on U.S. policy. And now you're saying the same thing needs to happen. And it was but working. And it, well, well, what happened? Well, it was working. And I, I, we don't have any criticism in the report. But quite frankly, when the troops were withdrawn in 2011, we lost our intel. We lost everything. The troops should have never been withdrawn. ISIS reestablished and came back then. So I think so, the previous administration did make a mistake on withdrawing those troops. We need a new approach. How do you protect the Christians? What do you do for the for safe the zone? Do you give them safe zones? Well, that's think, what In Defense of Christians is saying. Well, I think that's that's an option. I think you need to get all the groups together. They have to be together. The Yazidis, the Christians, everyone had to come up with an idea. But this can be done. I'm optimistic if America provides the leadership and the resources, also the West. If they do not, I believe we will see this thing set up the end of Christianity, quite frankly, in three or four years. And we'll know and that, quite frankly, one. by this Christmas. You're not the only one who's saying that. Uh, Archbishop Warda said that to me. He's the Archbishop well. of Rabiel, and he's helping um, help with these Christians. One other thing that you said you wanted to, to see happen is uh, that Representative Chris Smith, who is uh, a friend of the program here, uh, and also someone with whom you have worked for years and years and years, once uh, passed uh, H.R. 390. Correct in the House, and it's looking to go to the Senate. What would that do specifically? That's my number one recommendation. Chris Smith is one of the best members of Congress I've ever, ever served with. We've traveled together in many places. So what his bill does is sets aside and put the Congress on record with this pot of money that can be used for helping the rebuilding of, of water treatment, uh, electrical equipment, hospitals, and, and helping people. The passage of that quickly by the Senate when they come back in a week and a half is very, very important. And then a fresh eyes and a new team to look at this and solve the problem so we will have Christians in that community long after you and I are gone. Otherwise, it'll be over. Thank you for joining us, former Congressman Frank Wolf of Virginia. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro is asking the Pope for help. <laughs> Maduro says he needs to defend his country against a potential military action by the United States. He begs the Holy Father, saying, don't abandon us. Venezuela is in the middle of a political and economic crisis. Many Venezuelans blame Maduro and his socialist regime. The Vatican's Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, meets with Russian President Vladimir Putin. During the meeting, Putin said universal humanitarian values form the basis of Russia's ties with the Vatican, as well as relationships between the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Putin thanked the Holy See for sending relics of St. Nicholas on loan to Russia this summer. Paroline heads back to the Vatican tomorrow. Coming up, White House advisor Jared Kushner is in Egypt hours after the Trump administration announces changes in aid dollars to the country. We'll have an analysis, plus how U.S. lawmakers could help a growing crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The president of the Southern African Catholic Bishops Conference says he's deeply worried about unemployment in South Africa. Bishop Abel Gabuza says 70,000 mining jobs have been lost over the past two years and the country is feeling the pain. A Vatican News Agency reports the bishop is asking for a job summit to expand job creation. And the bishops in the Democratic Republic of Congo take a key role in trying to help their people escape violence and starvation.
but their efforts to broker a political peace seem to be at a stalemate. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi tells us what Americans and Congress can do to help. Good evening, Jason. Lauren, the experts assembled on Capitol Hill today say America must help solve the humanitarian crisis in Congo by fast-tracking aid and preventing funding cuts. Otherwise, they say the conflict could grow. Growing violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo scars the country. Agnes Lupitu says her six children were burnt alive and her husband fled and she doesn't even know if he's alive. Sadly, her story is not unique. There's not enough water, there's not enough food. Mike Jobbins from the group Search for Common Ground tells me thousands of Congolese people have been killed in the last year. The United Nations documents at least 40 mass graves and estimates more than a million people have had to flee fighting, many landing in refugee camps. You can't imagine it's tent after tent after tent and uh, it's absolutely uh, uh, horrendous. Today on Capitol Hill, these experts are sharing Congo's heartbreaking stories and asking America to help. This is a critical opportunity for U.S. leadership. The U.S. is very popular in the Congo. Stimson Center's Aditi Gurur says unless the United States acts, the crisis won't improve. Opponents of Congolese President Joseph Kabila say he's trying to power grab away the country's promised presidential election. Pope Francis urged him to respectfully talk with political opponents. Even the Congolese bishops got involved, helping broker a political deal to foster elections and prevent civil war. But they backed away in March, saying the agreement was ignored. I think what the government's trying to do is uh, sort of make token gestures to say that they're complying with that agreement, uh, when in spirit they are violating it. The Congolese president's term expired back in December, but he's still in office and no elections are scheduled this year, as was promised. Lauren? Jason, it sounds like the Catholic Church is playing a key role in Congo. Right. About half of the population of the Congo is Catholic. Catholic Relief Services is on the ground there, helping with food, water, and hygiene. Correspondent Jason Calvi at the Capitol. Thank you, Jason. Egypt's president and foreign minister meet with White House advisor Jared Kushner hours after the Trump administration cut or delayed hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to Cairo. This over human rights concerns. Kushner, who is also President Donald Trump's son-in-law, is on a Middle East tour aimed at exploring ways to revive Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. We are joined now by Larry Haas, a senior fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council. Thank you so much for joining us on News Thanks. Nightly. Thanks for having me. As an expert, how do you view the Trump administration to cut aid to Egypt, just as Kushner meets with their president? Well, it's obviously very strange timing. We're not going to get a regional peace agreement of any kind or even make progress without the Egyptians being involved. And the Egyptians, by the way, are working extremely closely with the Israelis on all sorts of security matters. So I don't think they're probably happy in Jerusalem that this happened. So I don't see this as a, as a way to make progress. So what Kushner has always said he wants to do is, and what it's what his father-in-law wants to do, which is peace in the right. Middle East. So what does Jared Kushner have that dozens of diplomats who went before him don't? Actually, uh, nothing other than, of course, the president's ear. But we have had plenty of diplomats trusted by previous presidents who have, who have come. So this is not a unique thing. What he lacks is any perspective, any sense of history, any gravitas. So I, I don't see why Jared Kushner is going to accomplish something that Dennis Ross, for instance, did not accomplish or Martin Indyk did not accomplish through numerous previous administrations. It's always been this elusive goal, President yes. Clinton. The, I mean, you, you can go back and, and no one has been able to really put a solid lid on this. President Trump hasn't explicitly endorsed the two-state solution, which has been at the heart of U.S. policy right. for nearly two decades. Right. What kind of strategy can we expect from this administration, do you think? You know, they go into the region basically saying, okay, what do you guys think? I mean, the United States has not really articulated a policy. To the extent that he was asked the question, he said, two states is fine with me, one state is fine with me. Jared Kushner is going to the region to hear from Bibi Netanyahu, to hear from Mahmoud Abbas, to hear from other leaders in the region. But he's not providing guidance. And I think the region is looking for U.S. guidance at this point. 
especially because of all of the stops and starts over the years. Thank you so much for your analysis, Larry Haas, senior fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council. Thank you. Up next, the Pope's message during his weekly audience at the Vatican will have a report from Rome, plus remembering the victims of the Barcelona attacks. Stay with us. Today, the church honors St. Rose of Lima. She has the honor of being the first person born in the Western Hemisphere to be canonized by the church. She was born in 1586 and later joined the Third Order of St. Dominic, donned the habit, and took a vow of perpetual virginity. She is the patron saint of the Americas. In his weekly reflection on hope today, Pope Francis says Christians can find comfort in difficult moments, knowing God makes all things new throughout history and in everyday life. He also received a laugh when speaking off the cuff in typical Francis style. Alcune volte ho detto con la faccia dei peperoncini all'aceto, no? Peperon, I'm going to say pepper. The Holy Father says Christians should be upbeat and cheerful, not bitter and glum, with the face of a sour chili pepper. Alan Holdren is the EWTN Rome Bureau Chief. Welcome to the program, Alan. What point was Pope Francis trying to drive home today? Well, he was saying that this life isn't the end of the road. He said that as Christians, our mission, our objective, and also the reason for our hope is to make it to eternal life in heaven with a tender and loving God. Um, he said that uh, those who have lost sight of this objective uh, may be embittered, they're overcome with sadness, but they shouldn't have this pickled hot pepper face, but rather they should know that the best is yet to come. The Pope often uses unique expressions. Are they common in the Italian language? Well, I mean, not as common as, as he uses them. He uses them f so frequently during his morning masses or during those general audiences. He's spoken before about Christian bats in the shadows, speaking about Christians who are sad. Uh, also about uh, people who peddle in hot air, those who will talk, talk, talk and don't act. Uh, but that's not, that's not the only thing the Pope does. He also makes up new words like misericordiando, which means mercying, uh, which is the act of, of going out and showing mercy, uh, something that he uses to apply to, to what he's thinking, but doesn't necessarily exist. It doesn't exist in the Italian language. I love it. He entered the audience today greeting people from Barcelona, Spain, and Congo, where there have been terrible acts of violence uh, in recent weeks. What was his message to them? Well, he, he said during the audience, he went off the cuff for a second, and he said that he had greeted those people on his way in, just saw them and went up and said hello, and he said all of the bad news that comes from places like those, and not only those, but all throughout the world, may get us down, but we really need to keep sight of the goal and make sure that that Christian hope doesn't disappear. Thank you so much, Alan Holdren, EWTN, Rome Bureau Chief. Thank you, Lauren. Officials in Malta are trying to determine what caused the ceiling of one of the country's oldest Catholic churches to collapse. No one was injured when wooden beams and other debris fell onto the marble altar of the Tegezu Church in the northern region of Malta. It was completed in the year 1500 and is dedicated to Mary. Franciscan friars who run the church made the discovery this morning when they opened the building for Mass. And one of Portugal's most famous monuments pays tribute to the victims of the deadly terror attack in and around Barcelona last week. The Castle of the Moors in Sintra was lit in the colors of the Catalan flag to mark the first of 15 days of mourning. Isn't that beautiful? Barcelona is located in the region of Catalonia, Spain. Fifteen people, including two Portuguese, were killed on Las Ramblas and in the resort town of Cambrils. That does it for all of us here at EWTN News Nightly. To all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. We leave you tonight with, you have to see this, a great moment of the general audience today when Pope Francis spotted a mini Pope. Look how happy, he loves children. He is always, always doing that to young children. It's just beautiful. Thanks for watching, good night, God bless.